All right, good afternoon. We'll resume our uh, afternoon session. First, I want to thank Sumitomo for the lunch today. Thank you very much. Very good. We got ice cream too. Um, also, I uh, want to thank Sugarbeet Research Education Board for funding. So just a big thank you there as well. And a reminder, there's CEU signups in the back. Um, other reminders on your programs, uh, it has the dates for the grower seminars. So Grand Forks, Fargo is the 1st and 3rd of February. February 10th, Mindac will be having there. So a date change as well there. And in Grafton, we'll have the 17th of February up in Grafton. So uh, yeah, we'll have our first speaker come up for the afternoon. The importance of tank mixing for management of Sakas release spot and sugar beet. We'll have Mr. Austin Lee talk about that. Um, well, thank you and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'll just jump right into it. Uh, as we've been hearing today, sugar beet growers deal with many challenges, but Cercospora leaf spot caused by the fungus, Cercospora baticula, has earned the reputation of being the most destructive foliar disease in sugar beets. And this is caused by the destruction of the leaf tissue seen in this photo, as well as the effects of the patho um, uh, pathotoxins produced by the fungus. And this results in reduced harvest weights and a reduction in sugar concentration and quality, and subsequently a significant economic loss. Just in 2016, over $140 million were lost in Minnesota and North Dakota due to Cercospora leaf spot. And this was due to two main reasons. One, the warm and wet conditions were conducive uh, for the development of the disease, and two, Samples collected across the co-ops um, in Minnesota and North Dakota indicated that 90% of those Cercospora isolates were resistant to the strobial urine, so the QOIs. And this just emphasizes the fact that we cannot afford to lose the DMI fungicides or the triazoles to fungicide resistance. So the rationale for this trial is that reports strongly suggest that tank mixing or combining products with different modes of action for one single spray application can provide more than additive effects in regards to disease control. And theoretically, less disease equals fewer opportunities um, for mutations to occur in Cercospora populations. However, anecdotal evidence, along with our own preliminary field trials, suggest undesirable effects can result from tank mixing certain chemistries and formulations. And lastly, uh, reports and field trials suggest contact fungicides and compounds other than copper and mancozeb uh, that could be an effective tank mix partner. So in 2020 and 2021, uh, we conducted an inoculated field trial um, in which combinations of DMI fungicides and uh, tank mix partners were evaluated for their effect on uh, root yield and sucrose quality and of course, um, control of Cercospora. Uh, essentially, from this field trial, the questions we aim to answer are, uh, are the DMIs or the tank mix partners providing equal control compared to each other? Are there any combinations that are synergistic or maybe even antagonistic? And lastly, do we see the same trends in both years of that field trial? And so the... Um, the DMI fungicide treatments we used were Proline, Minerva, Inspire XT, and Provisol. And the tank mix partners um, mainly include contact fungicides or those multi-site fungicides such as copper and mancozeb and also sulfur. We also included a biological control agent, uh, this bacillus species, and we included a fertilizer responsible for host plant defense induction. Uh, which is this phosphite or phosphonate. And we also included a bicarbonate-based compound um, that's, that may have fungicidal properties. And this is better known as baking soda. So um, those fungicide treatments were applied to the middle four rows and were applied repeatedly about every 10 days uh, for a total of five applications. And those applications began when disease was first apparent in, in mid-July, about two weeks after inoculation, and ended in late August. And to assess Cercospora leaf spot severity, 
I actually uh, regularly collected leaves from each plot, photographed each leaf, and then analyzed it with computer software, and then took the average percent severity to determine um, the ordinal ratings of zero to 10, and then 12 representative roots, um, or the middle two rows were harvested and weighed for root yield, and 12 roots were sent to the American Crystal Quality Lab in Moorhead for quality analysis. But now before I get into the results of the field trial, I'd just like to touch upon the two drastically different growing seasons we had in 2020 and 2021. In these figures, uh, the gray bars are showing the total amount of precipitation received, and that black line is representing um, the average daily temperature. And this is from April through September. And the summer months of 2020 were very wet with consistent rainfall. And in July, we actually received four inches more than our 30 year average. And in 2021, uh, we had a very dry and warm season, where in July, we received three inches less than our 30 year average. However, we finally did receive some much needed rainfall there at the end of the season. So this first figure is showing the recoverable sucrose per acre for all of the main plots. And this um, dotted line you see across the center is the average across all of the treatments. And that solid line in each box plot is representing the median and those asterisks represent the average. And um, so for this year, unfortunately, there were no significant differences among those main plots. And that could be for two main reasons. One that the no DMI main plot here, this one right here, um, represents all of the tank mix partners by themselves, including the Manco Zeb and Copper. And with the little rainfall we received, uh, there was fairly good circospora control achieved from those contact fungicides. And also the, the drought conditions through most of the season kept the relative level of disease um, relatively low. Um, but we can also see that that no DMI main plot again is the lowest uh, in terms of recoverable sucrose and the proline is the highest. And now this is um, the same figure here on the right hand side, but compared to last year, where the high disease levels we had in 2020 resulted in differences that were much more pronounced. Um, it's also possible that the timely rainfall we received in 2020 really limited the effectiveness of that no DM or those contact fungicides in that no DMI plot, you know, being that we had uh, almost weekly rainfall washing those contact fungicides off the leaf. And although there's quite a bit of variation uh, among those DMI treatments, statistically the achieved yield was equivalent, um, but Proline, or is it Proline and Inspire uh, did come out to be um, the highest there. And now still looking at recoverable sucrose per acre, uh, but looking at the tank mix partners. And there was in fact some significant differences this year. Most notably, where is that? it was the Manco Zeb, the copper, and actually the sulfur, the three contact fungicides that provided the greatest yield return. But also this phosphate here, um, was significantly better than the no partner um, subplot as well. And then comparing these tank mix partners to last year, we are seeing some of the same trends where in 2020, uh, the Manco Zeb provided the greatest yield return followed by copper and that phosphite. So just to give you an idea of the level of disease this past year, here's a photo showing the non-treated plot on the left uh, where we're seeing uh, some defoliation and quite a few uh, brown leaves there. And then the treated plot on the right, which has a, a full canopy and a good level of disease control. But now looking at disease progress for both years, you can see the level of disease in 2020, 2021 generally stayed below that uh, threshold of economic damage which is equivalent to a rating of six or also 3% severity. Um, but we're still able to see some of the same trends as 2020, where that no DMI main plot resulted in the highest level of disease and where disease progressed similarly for Minerva and Provisol 
And also the Inspire XT and the Pro line were comparable. And now looking at the final disease ratings for all of the treatment combinations. Um, so this no DMI main plot is now broken down into that non-treated control and then all of the tank mix partners by themselves. And then the, um, each of those DMI main plots here are broken down into the DMI by themselves and then all of those treatment combinations. And we can see here that that non-treated control did result in the highest level of disease and came out at about a rating a little below an eight. Um, but we can also see that all of these tank mix partners when compared to the DMI by itself are providing some improvement uh, except for uh, the bicarbonate with Proline and the Inspire XT with um, bicarbonate, which seem to be antagonistic. And we're also seeing that Mancozeb, this yellow plot here, is providing the greatest improvement in terms of disease control, and that was followed by copper. But the phosphate, the sulfur, and the bi um, biological are providing an improvement as well. So lastly, I have combined both years of data in terms of revenue per acre based on the most recent American Crystal Sugar payment. However, this does not accurately ref reflect real world applications, being that these treatments were repeatedly applied. And this does not factor in the cost of the fungicide applications. But just to recap, I want to highlight the top nine fungicide combinations. And for your reference, the non-treated control plot came in around about $1,000 per acre. And the combination that resulted in the highest return was Proline and Mancozeb, where we saw excellent disease control and also good yields. And next on the list is Inspire XT and the Sulfur, which had pretty fairly good Cercosper control. But in both years, we also saw a fairly large increase in sugar concentration. Uh, next are Proline and Inspire mixed with the phosphate, where we had good control, disease control, and we saw an increase in yields as well. Next here on the list is Inspire and Copper, followed by Minerva and Mancozeb. Next is the Proline and the Provisol with the biological. In this Provisol and biological combination, we also saw um, a pretty big increase in sugar concentration in both years as well. And then last on this list is Minerva and Copper. And for those of you who are just curious about using only Mancozeb, it came in around about $200 less than Proline and Mancozeb combined. So hopefully by looking at this table, you can see that each DMI performs best with a particular tank mix partner. And it's not just one tank mix partner, that works well across the board. So results um, show similar trends were observed in both 2020 and 2021, where tank mixing improved Cercospora leaf spot disease control and yields, despite the drastically different growing seasons. In addition, um, however, depending on that DMI and tank mix partner combination, interactions occurred that resulted in variable performance. So for example, the Proline and Mancozeb work great together. But when you combine Mancozeb with Inspire, we just don't see the same performance. In addition, the phosphite, the sulfur, and the biological all seem um, to be candidate tank mix partners. And depending on the combination, overall performance of those products were just as good or even better than some combinations with Mancozeb or copper. And just so you all know, we are also looking into how the addition of a tank mix partner interferes with the development of fungicide resistance on the molecular level. And hopefully next year, I'll be able to show some of those results at our next reporting session. So with that, I would just like to thank the Sugar Beet R&E Board for funding. I would like to thank uh, the many companies for chemical product and seed. I'd also like to thank the guys at our farm, particularly Jeff Nielsen and the rest of our summer crew. And of course, thank you to Dr. Ashok Chanda for his guidance and support. All right, our next presenter with the topic of management of rice, actonia diseases and sugar beet is Dr. Ashok Chanda.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, sticking around for the afternoon session here. So this is the only second talk today for talking about rise actonia. Um, so we'll just touch upon uh, actually three research trials that we did in 2021 and what did we find out. So, you know, first thing I always emphasize, you know, we just need to figure out what are the diseases that we have in a particular field, right? I mean, if you don't know what we're dealing with, there's no way we can manage them. So if you look at the number of samples that I received in uh, 2021, it's very minimal. It's 29 samples, right? So in a normal year, we get about 90 to 100 samples. That speaks volumes about the impact of weather on disease, especially the soil-borne diseases, right? So if you look at those 29 samples, again, the pattern that, that's very common over the past few years, right? We got about 17 samples at Rhizoctonia, one FNMICs, uh, only one with both of them, two physarium, you know, chemical, and then given how dry it was, there were so many samples that we didn't recover any pathogens. You know, most of them were like carryover issues, some kind of herbicide injury from previous seasons, right? So I think many people touched about the rainfall patterns again, you know, it's uh, from north end of the valley to all the way to the southern Minnesota. Most of the early season was dry, but as we went into August, we got some moisture, September, October. It's pretty good actually, you know, I was just quite amazed uh, how uh, resilient these beets are to pull up that yield by the end of the season. When we think about Rhizoctonia, it's a full season pathogen, but you know, it can affect any time before even the seedlings emerge uh, from the ground, right? We call this a pre-emergence damping off, but then it starts killing any time it's active in the soil. It can actually infect the soil line, you lose the seedling, but as you go into three, four weeks after planting, some of these young seedlings can be very susceptible to Rhizoctonia. And uh, as you go later into the season, you know, the best thing is to pick a nice warm afternoon, right? And then see some of the wilted plants, uh, but don't just depend on the tops. So you just need to pull those beaks and then look at the roots and uh, fair enough, you'll see a lot of root rot. But right next to the wilted plants, it's not uncommon to see already one or two dead plants. You know, that's where Rhizoctonia tends to move up and down uh, in the row there. But again, when you look at the roots, you know, more and more, we don't see that much crown rot uh, just because we are doing less and less cultivation unless it just changes uh, with other tillage practices right now. But we are seeing more of the root rot, you know, towards the bottom end of the roots, uh, which is very challenging uh, for the growers to manage, you know, for that we have some solutions. But what happens when these beets die, you know, the Rhizoctonia will go into the dormant phase it makes these resting structures, we call them uh, sclerotia, which can be inactive in the soil for two to three years. If you have a corn or soybeans in the rotation, they can infect those crops and then it just keeps sustaining until you have the next sugarbeet crop. So most of the growers are actually doing a pretty good uh, three to four year rotation with sugar beets. Uh, you know, that's, that's what needed to keep the rise of tony levels low. But if you have a susceptible host crops like soybeans, dry beans, or corn, you know, there is some amount of rhizoctonia that's always present in the soil. And also the weeds, uh, the pigweed or uh, lamb squatter, scotia, all of these are actually good hosts for rhizoctonia too. You know, and then early planting is very good because soil is still uh, cooler, which is not very good for rhizoctonia. So early planting, you get those uh, head start for those seedlings. So they can actually get uh, uh, past that seedling phase. And other options we have, we have pretty good resistant varieties. Not only these are good for rhizoctonia resistance, but also yield very well, you know, thanks to the breeders, which are combining uh, both traits. And also we have several fungicides that can be applied as a seed treatment or in for all, or only do a post-emergence application, right? So three different trials, I'm going to show some data here. So number one, I'm calling this as integrated rhizoctonia management. In this particular trial, what we do is uh, we, we evaluate two different varieties with different uh, seed treatment or infero fungicide and a different post-emergence application times. So this was planted on May 7 in Crookston. And prior to planting, we broadcast the inoculum at 50 kilograms per hectare. I got a 3.8 and a 4.8, two different varieties, low end and I know high resistance for rhizoctonia there. 
And then uh, for ad planting, there's nothing on the seed or in furrow, only cystiva on seed, cystiva with quadris in furrow or only quadris in furrow. These are our treatments. And then for a post emergence, no post compared to you know, four leaf, that's the normal time that we do it. And then eight leaf, that's a little bit later, but now more and more data that uh, we are uh, seeing the benefit from eight leaf application too. You know, it's a split split plot design. Uh, I'm listed uh, here, everything. And the data collection, we do a lot of stand counts, uh, right from uh, anywhere from two weeks all the way to six weeks. And uh, we collect a lot of data at the uh, harvest time. And then in, in terms of statistics, we looked at the main effects and also the possible interactions, uh, two-way and three-way. And the rating scale since 2020, we changed it a little bit. Uh, we use uh, now zero to 10 with each one point rating is like about 10% of the root rot on the surface of the roots. Again, monthly rainfall in Austin talked about a little bit. Uh, we lost about 50 to 40% of the rainfall until June compared to 10 year average. And extremely dry in July, just uh, about 10% of the regular 10 year average. You know, finally we got some moisture. And uh, because of this, uh, there's very little disease development early on, and uh, you can see the impact here, right? So we didn't see much interaction uh, among different factors. So I'm only showing the data for the main effects. The 3.8 and 4.8, as you can see, it took almost about three weeks, three to four weeks to get the good stands, you know, from all the way time from the planting. But between two varieties, you know, the susceptible one had slightly higher stands, but in you know, a statistically, these are not significantly different. So it's, it's not any uh, better. For the ad planting treatments, uh, follow this black line. You know, it's actually mixed with other colors too. This is my untreated. There is nothing on the seed. Number of plants for 100 foot of row on the y-axis and on the days after planting here. Again, really all the three C treatments uh, here, sorry, this is the ad planting one here, uh, the cystiva, or cystiva and quadris, or untreated plus quadris. You can see cystiva is slightly higher, but again, in terms of statistics, everything is very similar, right? So we barely got about uh, 165 plants for 100 foot of row. You know, typically we have anywhere from 190 to 200. You, know, you can see the impact of dry weather on emergence there. And for the post emergence, uh, like I said, there was no post or quadris applied at four leaf or eight leaf stage. For this, again, there is no significant difference whether it's a four or eight leaf application of quadris and more or less 165 plants for 100 foot of row. But the only interaction that we saw here was actually for recoverable sucrose per acre. There was a variety by post, which means they behave differently. If you look at the resistant variety, actually, even with the no post or four or eight leaf, you know, there's a slight bit of increase in RSA, whereas a susceptible variety, which is 4.8, we got about 500 pounds per acre increase just with this, uh, you know, four or eight leaf application. But this data is also averaged across all the ad planting treatments here. So you just have to keep that in mind. And the next trial that I'm going to show you is, this is just purely, we use a 4.8 variety, which is very susceptible to rhizoctonia, where we evaluated all the available seed treatments and also inferrofungicides. You know, this is almost like apples to apples comparison in one trial here. This was done in Crookston again. We inoculated this uh, you know, plots prior to planting. So this is my untreated control. You can see again, took few weeks to get the emergence all the way up to 150. Then we started losing a little bit of stands here, but this more or less stable because again, the dry conditions are not very, very favorable for rhizoctonia disease development. And once I start adding the seed treatments, so that's my cystiva line here, and then cabina and vibrance, right? Exactly, you know, they're exactly similar. You know, my message has been, no matter what you pick, you know, all of the label C treatments for rhizoctonia, they work very well. So don't worry about which one you're getting. And the one new compound that got labeled in 2021, it's called Zelterra. That's in Pilfloxam, the SDHI class. And then it did very well in 2021. 
So the number of uh, plants are slightly higher compared to the seed treatments, uh, the other uh, previous ones, but in terms of statistics, it is pretty similar. And one common thing that we see whenever we use infer of fungicides, especially when it's a you know, drier and cooler conditions, they can hurt the stands. But in 2021, we only had dry conditions and it was fairly warm with lack of moisture. But it's the same line that I showed you earlier for my untreated control. And then that is actually a quadris at nine and a half fluid ounce. You can see the stand was reduced right from the emergence at two weeks, you know, all the way to six weeks. And then I have a preaxer here, and then that's the elatus. It's a combination of a quadris and a SDHI. And this is actually asteroid, look a little bit better uh, compared to quadris. And then I have propuls. And then this is actually, uh, Xanthian infero, you know, this is a combination of headline and a biological. I know it was there in the market uh, until last year, but it's not available anymore. But we just try to combine the headline component and the biological one and then try to see how it's doing. And then the last one is actually ProLine, you know, which did real uh, okay. But again, you just have to keep in mind, you know, it's not really high disease pressure situation in 2021. But again, like I said, the seed treatments and the infero, I'm comparing them as two groups here. Both of them, you can see the with inferos, we got anywhere from you know, 10 to 12 plants less per 100 foot of road compared to seed treatments. But by the time we go to harvest, there's not much difference between the seed treatments and infero ones, 131 versus 126. And most of the yield and other parameters are not significantly different between seed treatments and infero fungicides. So the only difference we saw for uh, recoverable sucrose per ton and also percent sugar, but when you come to RSA, it was more or less similar. And the third trial that I'm going to show some data is from uh, it's a po only post emergence treatments here. So we use the same variety that with the 4.8 rating for Rhizoctonia. And then we applied several different uh, post-emergence treatments. But the only difference here is uh, we inoculated these plots on June 23rd. You know, we use a Gandhi applicator and we put this barley inoculum. And then next day we applied the fungicide treatments. So we got about six tenths of the rain on June 23rd. And also once we apply the inoculum, we actually rake some soil into the crowns just to make sure that you know it's protected. So we got a pretty good disease development in this particular trial. So the non-treated control were the bottom portion here. We lost about, from the June 24th until harvest, we lost about 52% of the plants. And uh, we ended up with only 4,400 RSA. And the ingredient that we have one in Excalia, it's the same gender as seed treatment, but as a post application, it did pretty good about 9,700 pounds RSA and very less road track and 13%. And most of the products that have azoxystroven, whether it's Quadris or Asteroid, they all did pretty good in 2021 as a post application. You know, statistically, these are all very similar. And I'm going to share this presentation on the SBREB website so you can actually uh, get these numbers. And the other thing I have is the top guard EQ. It's azoxystrobin in a combination. And also Elatus, it's azoxystrobin and then SDHI. It did very well too. I'm almost done, Joe, here. And then I know some of the less commonly used products for Isaacsonia, the Baxter and Proline. Again, you know, 2021 was not like, you know, a very high disease severity year. So these products did well too. The only thing really uh, didn't do that much was you know, propulse in 2021. Like in the real world, if you use any one of those products all the way from Excalia to propulse, I think you would have gotten some you know, good benefit in protecting beets from Rhizoctonia. So to summarize, you know, the varieties, those are pretty good, but uh, as you know, resistant varieties, they may not make any difference you know, in a normal year. The seed treatments are pretty good. They offer protection early on for four to five weeks. And infero fungicides, they do very good. But if you have cooler and drier conditions, you know, you can hurt some stands. But by the end of the harvest, it's okay. 
And for the post emergency application, you know, between four and eight, that's from the first week of June to third week of June, I think pretty good you know, time frame for you to get them on. So the good rhizoctonia pack package, I would say, you know, a good seed treatment followed by a post in a normal field. But if you have a really severe field uh, for rhizoctonia, I think you should also think about it for, for a full season control. So with that, I would like to thank the R&D board, uh, you know, the Sure Co-ops, and then the companies for all the products. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, uh, with all the COVID restrictions, uh, the you know, hardworking crew uh, in the lab and the field. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chama, for the presentation and your work. Our next speaker will be talking about evaluating the addition of adjuvants to fungicides for reducing disease severity caused by Cosmopeda coli and increasing sugar beet yield and quality. He presented by Mr. Young. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about do adjuvants improve the efficacy of fungicide in controlling Cyprospora leaf spot of sugar beet. So sugar beet is an important sugar yielding crop next to sugar cane produced more than 130 countries of the world, especially produced for sugar. So as a byproduct, you also get molasses and pulps. It has a versatile uses in our day-to-day -day life. Even we cannot think a single day without sugar. So it seems how sugar beet is important to our day-to-day -day life. So sugar beet can be used in alcoholic beverages, anti-icing products in road communication in some uh, warmer states of the United States. It's becoming very popular in some Asian countries as animal, poultry, and fish feed, fish feed industries. And it has great economic importance in industry, the uridine and the betan chemicals. Sugar beet produces uh, in many countries of the world, especially in the temperate countries as a summer crop. So Russia ranked first uh, among sugar beet producing countries in the world, followed by France. US ranked third, it produced approximately 33 million tons sugar beet annually, followed by Germany and Turkey. Three giant sugar beet cooperatives, American Crystal Sugar Company, Mindac Farmers Cooperative, and Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative combinedly contributed approximately 57% of total US sugar, pro sugar production, which is almost about uh, $5 billion economic activities. In the United States, Minnesota and North Dakota are two leading sugar beet producing states where Minnesota produce uh, about 11.36 million tons, whereas North Dakota produce half of that amount that Minnesota produce. Sugar beet production is in influenced by many factors, among them surface pearly spot, it's considered to be one of the most destructive foliar fungal disease caused by Sarcospora beticola. So it's a hemibiotropic fungus, polycyclic in nature during the growing season. So it produces two non-host selective toxins, Sarcosporin and beticolin, and other enzymes that represent the visible symptoms on the leaf of sugar beet. It has significant impact, the loss estimated up to 40% or even more in severe conditions. It reduced sugar quality, and that indicates how he used the monitored losses and also decreases the storability in the piles. Typically, the symptoms on the sugar beet leaves are uh, small, tiny, at the early in the seasons that is crazed with gray center, surrounded by thin or uh, brown color margin. And then with advancement of time that it uh, become very blight and that the all feel completely uh, represent a blighted feel. And even due to high disease pressure or delayed harvesting, so it's showing that regeneration of new leaves that already starts consuming the stored sugar in the sugar beet that ultimately at the meal uh, represents the large recoverable sugar in the sugar beet. The, the typical feature it has, it, it uh, uh, infecting structures, conidia and mycelia that causes infection. Each and every lesion contains pseudostroma. This is the overwintering structure of Sarcospora beticola. Uh, every lesion has numerous pseudostroma and in the conducive con environment, it regenerates conidiophore, conidia, and then that continues its life cycle in the green season. 
Currently, the growers are highly recommended to use tolerant varieties or resistant varieties if available and sanitation practices to reduce the initial amount of inoculum in the field and deep tillage operations. And crop rotation with non-host at least three years are highly recommended. And, and as a last resort, timely spraying of fungicide could be a better option for controlling Sarcospora beticola. But development of widespread resistance to Sarcospora beticola is a major concern. That is, the Sarcospora beticola is highly resistant to QA fungicide, thiophenate methyl stopsin, and it reduces sensitivity to triazole and TPDH fungicide, and even cross resistance to four major mode of action of fungicide. So what happens, it has that results complete, sometime complete management failure, and even economic losses in as, uh, the statistics in 1998 when CLS epidemic first appeared, it, uh, American crystal sugar uh, reported about 130 million uh, economic losses during that year. And recently in 2016, about $200 million uh, losses due to Sarcospora uh, leaf spot of sugar beet. And even sensitivity of uh, Sarcospora beticola to triazole of eminent inspiring proline and probisol and, since, and the mutation G143 mutation in those isolates, this, in this graph indicating uh, since 2012 to 2019. So, and even efficacy of fungicide is highly influenced by many environmental factors, wind, heat, solar radiation and rainfall. And rainfall could be one of the most important of even that uh, plays important role in reducing the efficacy of fungicide that wash off and has redistribution impact, even deposit and has residual activity and also major concern for environmental pollutions too. So with a view to, uh, to keep retain the fungicidal efficacy or retention of fungicide, longer time. So we plan to add adjuvants onto fungicide tank mix to increase the efficacy or even the retention period as immediate after the fungicide spray, if rainfall happen, it may wash off the fungicide. So we wanted to see how adjuvants impact on efficacy of fungicide. Generally, it's very popular, the adjuvants on herbicide, but we added these uh, adjuvants to see how the commonly used fungicide improve the efficacy of uh, fungicide that are generally used for controlling Sarcospora beticola. Adjuvants are just any substance added to a spray, uh, spray tank that other than fungicide formulation, it's supposed to improve the performance or efficacy of fungicide. It started since in back 1950 to 60. Currently it has around 155 spray adjuvants, which are of different uh, natures, about 25 categories. Most common are surfactant, sprayer, sticker, penetrant, emulsifier, and uh, oil-based, and so on. So when, if we consider the water droplets on the leaf surface, because of poor weighting and higher surface tension, so it has very less coverage on the surface of the leaf. If added with adjuvants, the picture right on the bottom that indicates that because of lower surface tension, it provided better surface coverage on the spread surface. So with a view to, uh, uh, to see uh, the, how the adjuvants work uh, when it's added to fungicide, how it uh, 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 either it improved the efficacy of fungicide or not for controlling Sarcospora beticola um, uh, of CLS. So we had this study in Foxham, Minnesota for uh, 2019, 2020, and 2021, three years that we use a variety that is more susceptible to Sarcospora leaf spot. We use different mode of action of fungicide and even different types of adjuvants. We evaluated the disease uh, CLS severity and sugar beet yield loss is found per acre. So we used fungicide, triazole fungicide, Inspirexte recommended dose of all fungicide, EVDC. From EVDC group, we use PENCOJEP, and from copper fungicide, we use badge SC. We use three different adjuvants, which are complex, transfix, preference, and elite. 
I'll, we use the recommended dose uh, from the manufacturers. There's some important feature of those uh, adjuvants, complex. Uh, this most important feature is, is the spreader. It has great contact activity, better penetration, increase adhesion and reduce surface tension. Cerium elite is a well-known penetrant, non, it's non-volatile, prevents diffusion of uh, spray, increased penetration, and sure battery spray coverages. So Transfix is a, uh, an excellent resin-based sticker and it facilitates leaf coverages. Uh, preference is an activator, improves spray droplets, reduce surface tension, and it has a important feature like better protection against UV ultraviolet. So you use one to 10 disease severity scale uh, of John and uh, Windows 1991. So we use a special uh, nozzle that has two 110 degree flat fan spray. Uh, we compare with it with a conventional flat fan spray that has 60 degree back one for us. So that ensures better coverage and uniform distribution of the droplets. So if you see in the picture left, on your right, uh, left, uh, right, that uh, conventional flat fan spray has this less wider spray cover as, and compared to conventional turbo twin jet has wider spray droplets. So, and even we use Syngenta spot card, droplet spot card to see uh, the number of droplets and even their distribution. We found it provided better best coverage and uniform distribution of the lead. Even in fungicide, when you use only fungicide, although some fungicide has some adjuvant properties, but when we spray it on the leaf, you see most of the spots are individual and distinctive, but when added with adjuvants, it indicating that fungicide spread it and ensure better coverage of the droplets on the surface of the leaves. So in for about three years, we had 17 treatments in Foxum for uh, CLS trial, CLS fungicide adjuvant trials. So including uh, untreated inoculated checks, uh, we use fungicide adjuvants, fungicide alone, fungicide uh, mixed with adjuvants. Uh, we did CLS severity and we had uh, yield data that uh, found recoverable, recoverable sugar. And we did uh, statistical analysis, non-parametric to relative effect of the treatment. Um, so from in the field, we use 17 gallon per acre uh, for tank mix. The speed we maintain uh, for MPH nozzle that I mentioned, turbo twin jet, and we spray fungicide at 14 days interval. So after spraying fungicide, you see the droplet on the leaf surface. Uh, on CLS infected sugar beet leaves. So we also keep track on the fungicide uh, rainfall event at uh, Foxum. So generally rainfall has four categories, trace to heavy rainfall, uh, per in, uh, this intensity calculated per hour. So trace is 0.1 and heavy rainfall is under category of 1.74 to 3.5 inches per hour. So average monthly pre pre precipitation in 2020 is maximum in June 17, 3.7. And like from May to of, um, July, the rainfall event was higher and even daily chances of precipitation was more than approximately 41%. In 2019, rainfall in the growing season, like from June to uh, late September, it was more than like about three or around three. In 2021, of uh, more rainfall event was in during the uh, mid of June, 3.43 inches uh, on, that, on the time. So what you found from uh, CLS uh, adjuvant and fungicide trial in Foxum. So in from three years uh, in 2020, we didn't see any treatment effect on fungicide and adjuvant because of heavy rainfall uh, and wet condition on that specific year. So from 2020, uh, the, because of uh, high heavy rainfall, so we didn't see any significant effect of the treatments uh, compared to inoculated check. Uh, in recoverable sugar in 2020, so we didn't see 
even any significant impact of the treatments, either fungicide added to fungicide or fungicide used alone. So in 2020, 2019 and 2021, so first, uh, when you use fungicide alone, it indicates uh, though Inspire didn't provide it better control compared to other, but uh, they are not significantly different from each other. Pencojet provided comparatively better control compared to Badge and Inspire. And when added, this fungicide added with an adjuvant CE, that's cerium elite, it's showing there is uh, no significant difference showing the similar trend, either added adjuvants with fungicide or not. But rotation of fungicide, mixture of fungicide in rotation program that indicate R, that is showing little bit reduced disease severity, but they are not statistically different. Even R, that means rotation of fungicide, uh, and even R plus CE, that, in, uh, that means fund, uh, adjuvants added with rotation of fungicide mixture in rotation. So no, no significant differences among relative effect of the treatments in controlling surface prolif spot. And even, uh, and even when uh, other adjuvants, it's C indicates complex, that's also showed the similar trends, no significant difference among the uh, treatment when fungicide use alone either alone or mixtures in the rotation program. So in recoverable sugar yield data in both 2019 and 2021. So in 2021, only complex, it's provided comp better, con uh, be uh, provided higher yield compared to other adjuvants, though they are not statistically different and except uh, provided highest, uh, uh, higher recoverable sugar in, when complex mixed with Inspire, but only except in Transpix, so in added with batch, comparatively lower yield. And even in 2021, if you look at on the Transpix table, there's lower recoverable sugar, but they are not statistically different compared to other adjuvants. So uh, the field trial at uh, Foxtom in 2019, it's a uh, non-treated check. So Pencojep when used alone and Pencojep with complex and Pencojep plus transkip and visually it's, it indicating there are not much differences either fungicide added or fun, uh, added with adjuvants or fungicide is sprayed alone. So badge, first picture is badge and badge plus complex, badge plus transfix uh, and inspire. So the similar trend for uh, this uh, DMA fungicide two, and in 2021, the stone-treated checks that because of high disease pressure and complete lighting of the leaves, and Pencojep in 2021 with alone with light and Transpix, it's showing visually no differences uh, for controlling sarcospora leaf spot in sugar beet. So batch, it's the same trend. So either they use alone or mixed with adjuvants. And for Inspire this year, the Inspire didn't provide it better control compared to other. Uh, and fungicide mixtures in rotation, this indicates uh, it's showing better control compared to other, but when added serum elite, uh, not much significant differences when used alone or added with fungicide uh, adjuvants. So in 2020, uh, because of heavy rainfall and wet condition on the top corner as no fungicide or even fungicide mixed with adjuvants provided any uh, significant effect of the treatment. So we can conclude that Sarcospora beticola causes significant reduction in recoverable sugar uh, of uh, sucrose of sugar beet if not managed properly. And the fungicide evaluated provided fair to good control of Sarcospora leaf spot in dry condition, especially fungicide mixtures in a rotation program. So addition of one adjuvant complex was effective at improving efficacy of Inspire, Trizol, and resulted in higher recoverable sugar only in 2019. And under heavy rainfall condition, none of the adjuvants improve efficacy of the fungicide at controlling surface product score. So I would like to thank my research advisor, Dr. Mohamed Khan for his 
continuous mentoring and support for doing the research and my PhD uh, committee member and Peter Hack, who's who did a lot of great help for my research during the growing season and summer intern and Dr. Ian Shiliu and Fereste. And I would like to give a uh, uh, cordial thanks to Sugar Beet Research and Education Board and Plant Pathology Department for uh, accepting me as a grad student. And thank you all for your passion sharing. And I would love, would love to have any questions. All right, our next speaker. Topic is single pass delivery of insecticide, fungicide, and fertilizer complications. It impacts on regulated control and yield. Mr. Jacob Ricketts will be presenting that. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to discuss what we did. Uh, this uh, study uh, was replicated. Uh, we did it in two uh, sites uh, in 2021. But uh, the uh, St. Thomas site, actually, uh, what I'm going to present to you is a two-year data set. Um, uh, let's see, and, uh, the plot sizes there were our traditional size of 35 feet long, uh, six row plots with the center four rows uh, treated. And then in a randomized complete design. And uh, no, no, there's no significant uh, treatment by year interaction. So it's a, it's a pretty good solid uh, data set. And then the other location was uh, at Prosper, North Dakota. Uh, this was our no pest site to see, uh, we we're trying to uh, assess uh, efficacy of these chemical treatments. Um, and this was planted a little bit later than traditionally in the Valley, uh, just because we had to plant St. Thomas first. Um, uh, those are two row plots at 30 feet uh, long um, with uh, four rows. So it'd be two row treatment side by side. Um, and also that was another uh, randomized complete block design uh, replicated four times. Uh, the performance assessments that we did on all trials uh, were done with stand counts. Um, and just at the uh, St. Thomas uh, location, we assessed uh, uh, root maggot feeding injury. Uh, we took 10 plants from, uh, from two rows. And uh, again, that was only done at St. Thomas where the pest was uh, prevalent. And then we also did uh, uh, recovery uh, soup curls yield. Uh, we harvested two center rolls uh, at Prosper, it would have been 60 feet total. And then at uh, St. Thomas, it was at 70 feet total. And then uh, all the data was analyzed using the SAS program and uh, with an alpha value of uh, 5%. And here, uh, like I said, I'm just gonna reiterate, this is a two year data set for uh, feeding injury. Um, we had some pretty significant uh, uh, maggot pressure in both years, uh, heavily emphasized uh, on the fertilizer check and also the regular check. Um, the scale goes up to nine, but I had to kind of zoom it in to get it all to fit. Um, the, uh, we did uh, two rates of counter uh, for good visual difference or comparatives. And then we also had two rates of counter, the same two rates of counter applied with uh, uh, DIF or dribbled in and furrow uh, 1034 O. And then uh, we did uh, two, uh, treatments of Yuma 4E, uh, which would be your Copyrophos. Uh, we did that with a one point rate and a two point rate. Uh, that was all mixed in with a 10 fluid ounces rate of uh, Quadrus. And uh, those were banded on with 10 inch, 10 inch bands. And then also we did a uh, 10 inch uh, uh, Quadrus alone band with uh, Thymet on top of that. And then also a regular Thymet. Uh, with nothing else except for the uh, high rate of counter as well. And uh, down below here are the counter rates. Uh, and uh, I'd like to point out too that uh, we had some pretty good control with the uh, double combinations of insecticide, uh, be it with the, the club pyrophos or with the thymet with the high rates of counter. Um, they actually were statistically different than the uh, just the base rates of counter. As you can see on the left. 
and significantly different than uh, the checks. Uh, here was uh, stand count data here. Uh, this is at St. Thomas just for year 2020. We didn't combine the stand counts. And uh, I just want to point out here that the stand counts are grouped in by uh, the, the same color. And then the, the uh, letter on top of that would correspond to this column here. So it's just the same color columns uh, stating the, the similarities and the differences. Um, pretty, uh, uh, the checks pretty stand, stand out pretty well. Uh, they got hammered pretty good. Um, and then the insecticide, single treatments, insecticides still held up pretty good. And then, then uh, the, also the uh, uh, dual insecticide applications um, did see a little bit of here of a difference uh, with the stand count, but it really jumped up uh, later at a date. Uh, and then, oh, I suppose I should have uh, mentioned that uh, orange would be 49 day uh, DAP, which is date after plant, days after planting, and then also a 62 day uh, count after that. And then these were applied one day before pre peak as well, the uh, Yuma and the Thymets with the quadrus as well. And this would be 2021. Uh, we're able to get four counts in with this, uh, starting with 20 day, 27 days after planting and ranged all the way up to the 48 days or 49 days after planting. Um, I just want to kind of show, uh, point out that we're seeing uh, kind of a slant going from high to the, uh, to the right or from the left to the right and we're seeing a decrease in population. And that's due to maggot feeding and injury. Um, as you can see on the far right, uh, the, the checks and the fertilizer check, it really, they really got significantly hammered. Um, uh, it, it was an amazing year <laughs> in terms of uh, maggot pressure. What did I do? Oh, then this would be at uh, the Prosper site with no pest. And uh, you may notice that there, you won't see any letters on top of these columns because there were no uh, significant differences in between all these stand counts. It kind of held statistically true for each treatment in terms of stands. And here would be a 2021 St. Thomas uh, pictures. On the upper left would be the check. Like I said, it was a very good year for maggots. Uh, they were uh, pretty high in our St. Thomas location. And uh, below that would just be the base rate of, of a high uh, labeled rate of counter. And even there, you can see that uh, they got uh, reduced. You can visually see the rolls in between. And uh, another thing I'd like to point out too, uh, with the more healthier uh, treatments here in the center and then the right, uh, the border rolls are completely untreated uh, with insecticide. And you can see how those just disappeared due to mega feeding. But um, our, uh, the I, I guess what I would like to point out on the, on the center treatments in the right, uh, both top and bottom, uh, dual insecticide combinations are still working pretty well, at least above ground. You can see that they were pretty good for control. Um, and here for, for recovery sucrose in St. Thomas, uh, it did show that we are still having some pretty good control with dual insecticides. Um, uh, let's see here. In terms of comparing it to just one base rate of insecticide, um, and even those are even separated out with the checks too. So. Um, we're still getting some pretty good control with granule insecticides and then also with the Yumas. And uh, at uh, that, they had, this was uh, with the two year data set, these, these were applied on an average of three days uh, pre peak. Not ideal. I want to try to get that a little bit sooner. Still supplied some pretty good control 
And then here would be the, the uh, recovery sucrose yield at Prosper of this year. Um, all pretty good, but uh, we are seeing a little bit of a negative here with the com combinations of Yuma and Quadras. Um, don't know 100% what's what's going on there, but we might we think that there might it was a very hot summer as everyone is aware. Uh, and these were applied in late June that we might be seeing some kind of correlation there with the heat. And we did notice too uh, at Prosper and also at St. Thomas uh, with the combination of quadris with the insecticide. Uh, we are noticing a, a little bit of curling along leaf margins on the outside and they curl up. Um, I, we noticed that and yeah, just the, the quadrus affected, uh, or I shouldn't say affected, uh, quadrus treated plots. And uh, I think that was around six to eight leaf stage when we took those photos. And, uh, but as the data shows that they, they grew out of that then so and still had some good yield and then here would be um those combinations of of thiamate with plus quadris and then also uh, yuma at the high rate of two pint um with quadris and we still see some of that leaf curling especially in the newer leaves and here's uh your uh, return or your gain over compared to the check base, which is 585. Um, just on this one, I'd like to show that uh, you're getting a lot more return with those dual uh, insecticide treatments. Um, there's, you're still getting a good return on those compared to your single, single insecticide treatments. And then at Prosper, we're uh, unfortunately uh, kind of cuts off right after those first two treatments there. And then when you start throwing in more chemistry, we're seeing a reduction in profit. So um, based, on, uh, based on what you're seeing out in the field, it might not be, it's just kind of emphasizes the need for scouting and trying to make a determination if you need to put that much input in there. But uh, as it illustrates on here, it's not needed or wasn't needed in Prosper, but. Then uh, conclude, uh, we did, like I said, we said saw some negative symptoms there with that curling. Um, and that was just with the Yuma uh, applied with Quadris and also with Thymet, I should have put that in there. But uh, they, like I said, they came out of it. Um, might be, um, might be somewhat maybe related to with the heat units that we we're seeing in, in June. Uh, at the St. Thomas Mega site, uh, we didn't have any uh, detectable yield loss between the, the tank mixing of uh, Quadris and, and Yuma. And then also uh, with applying uh, Quadris uh, congruently, uh, concurrently with uh, the thymate application uh, right before the thymate on. Um, we're still seeing some good uh, uh, return on yield and with uh, revenue on dual inside applications, even still under high maggot pressure. So, um, but at Prosper with no pest per, uh, present, um, the combination of the Yuma and the Quadris, especially the, the Yuma at the high rate of, of, four, uh, of two pints per acre, we're seeing a significant sucrose uh, loss. And then there was 10.6%. Uh, and then that's also about $175 uh, dollars per acre of a loss just because of that hit. Um, and as many are, are aware, we lost our pyrophos, which Mark will touch on right after me a little bit more in detail. But uh, with that, uh, we have, I think we should uh, repeat this research, looking at different alternatives. Um, Registered alternatives, probably the pyrethroids, probably with Mustang or Sauna, and see if we have any uh, interactions there. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank the Sugar Beet Research and Education Board, uh, Ag Industry for uh, Chemicals and uh, Seed, uh, our cooperator, Daryl Collette, he was uh, great to work with, 
uh, my research colleagues at, the, at NDSU and also uh, Emma, uh, uh, Crookston, and then also my summer assistants. They, they did a great job this year gathering all the data that we needed to present to you today. All right, uh, very good. Uh, as Jake alluded to, I'm going to uh, try and address the uh, loss of uh, chlorpyrifos. Um, as far as I know, it's gone. I know there's some rumblings about lawsuits and that kind of thing, but I think we have to also think about the future um, and uh, pursue aggressively pursue other tools. And uh, my talk, I always kind of apologize for it because I, uh, but I think it's what uh, some people at least want to hear too is uh, what we're expecting for the uh, root make forecast in, 20, in the coming upcoming growing season because those two are very much related. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the uh, root maggot, uh, especially our uh, online audience, if there are any of the uh, um, our, uh, European friends, uh, the root maggot uh, doesn't tunnel into the root to cause its damage. It actually has a pair of oral hooks that it feeds with, and it's, it does a rasping type of injury to the plant and then uh, consumes the exudate from the root. And uh, under severe, especially droughty conditions, as uh, Jake's uh, photographs really showed well, is uh, that uh, if that uh, injury occurs early enough and is severe enough, and if it's dry, uh, it, it can kill the plants. And it killed the uh, roommate, it killed a lot of plants at St. Thomas. And uh, Dr. Chu can attest to that as well yeah, for him, for his plots. So, um, uh, yeah, it's a very significant economic pest. Uh, it's more than just stand loss too. We see uh, uh, significant yield losses. And uh, so when we run our trials, we do rate all, all the plots on the zero to nine scale of Campbell et al. Because we need to validate that what's going on is actually the product of root, of root maggot feeding injury. Uh, my methods are very similar to Jake's, so I won't go into that too much. I just want to point out that in those combined analyses in both uh, Jake's uh, presentation and mine, um, I, I really, um, I'm pretty OCD about my um, stats. And uh, uh, when I make recommendations, I want to make sure that I have uh, the, the uh, I guess, the teeth and the data the uh, robustness in the data to make those recommendations and then be reliable. So um, with that, so anytime you see a combined analysis, it has been tested and uh, quite vigorously. <laughs> um, this uh, first slide is uh, the results of a, an ongoing trial that we've had actually for quite a few years, but these are common treatments that we had the last couple of years. And I chose 20 and 20, 2020 and 21 because that's where some of the, a little bit of optimism came out of those runs of the trial. You know, the treatments are kind of changing from year to year, but these are common to those two years. Uh, as the uh, one thing to point out is the, quite obvious, but the, the uh, red oval, um, and by the way, one thing to point out on this, this particular slide is that these are all single application treatments. So they're either an at plant band, uh, usually, yeah, either if it's a granular, it's just a conventional band. If it's, if it's a liquid, it's a three inch T band over the open seed furrow. And so we've got granulars, uh, conventional granulars at, top, at the top, the uh, highest labeled rate of counter followed by 7.5 pounds, which is what we kind of consider a moderate rate. And so when I run trials like this, where we're looking at new products, I'm really beating the bushes, hoping that we can have something that is least, at least kind of in the ballpark of the way that we know counter um, manages the root maggot. And so the good news in this slide is, is that within that blue rectangle, those four treatments were all not statistically different from each other. So the, the, uh, and it's not really, uh, Asana is not really an experimental. It is registered for use in beets. Um, uh, but uh, many of the other products are experimentals. But what we found, and this is a trend we've seen now for two years, is that when we add exponent, which is a synergist, 
to Asana XL, we tend to either get numerically or significantly uh, in a significant increase in control and in yield benefits as well. It's not always significant, but what it does is it improves that the uh, performance of Asana enough that it's, it performs at a level that's comparable to any of the standards, uh, a single application of the standards. So that's one good take home from here. Um, on the far right, uh, similar to what uh, Jake's uh, slides showed, I like to um, take the untreated control so a grower or an ag advisor can look at that and say, okay, uh, how did the treatments perform compared to doing nothing? What was the benefit? It's not truly a net benefit because I'm not taking into account the cost of, of uh, the control measure because that is so, it's such a moving target. But as you can see, we got very good um, returns out of all of these treatments or uh, all of those top four treatments. Unfortunately, we didn't get very good performance out of diabrome. Uh, it's, I would say, one that uh, maybe we need to uh, look further at and not give up on. I was very disappointed in this two-year analysis on Vidate, though, uh, because we've seen better control out of it in the past, but uh, uh, obviously it did not shake out too well. Um, just a few pictures. This happens to be the uh, plots, what the plots looked like in uh, 2020. So it's not quite as dramatic as what uh, uh, the photos that Jake was showing, but it does show fairly well the contrast between Asana, uh, the upper left, and then the center one where we added the synergist. And uh, so I think that, that illustrates that pretty well. Um, on the far right, top row, top right, uh, we have Endigo ZCX. Uh, that was not in the previous slide because we we were initially looking at it as a T-band, and uh, I'm told that the uh, company that manufactures that is probably going to be going with a uh, broadcast recommendation. So in 2021, we did test it. It's just that it was used as a, a broadcast. So, and we've gotten encouraging results out of both years, uh, just different placements. Uh, this next one is kind of a busy one, so I color coded it. Uh, for you a little bit to break it down. Um, basically, this we're kind of looking at MIDAC and then Bifender as well as alternatives for rubagic control. And uh, MIDAC does have a label for use in sugar beet. Bifender is not registered at this, this time. So essentially, this is kind of an experimental trial as well. But we got a, a very good performance out of combining Pancho Beta, and, and some of these, as you'll see, they, they include a 1034-old starter fertilizer as well. Um, uh, MIDAC is known for being a pretty good tank mix uh, or friendly mix uh, partner with 1034-0, and uh, that top treatment did, did very well, as you can see, comparable to the highest labeled rate of counter with regard to root injury ratings and then yield and revenue also. Another trend that we observed was this uh, three inch T-band of pipe, a bifender. That actually was statistically superior to the dribble in furrow, which is, I know if you're a grower, that's kind of probably a disappointing finding because you'd much rather uh, maintain microtubes on your planter than a nozzle system. But I've seen that before with pyrethroid materials. We've seen it with Mustang on springtails. It, 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 those materials seem to work better when they're applied um, as a T-band. Uh, next, uh, this is a two-year combined analysis. So we're wanting to look at Mustang. We have a lot more data on Mustang. I just don't have time to show you everything today. Uh, what this uh, uh, entailed was uh, uh, single and then double applications of either uh, Yuma 4E, which uh, Jake had mentioned, is a uh, chlorpyrifos formulation, essentially the same as Lorthban 4E. Uh, unfortunately, in this two-year combined analysis, the uh, combining Yuma, as you can see, the counter is the common base treatment for everything in there other than the untreated check. But uh, the, the contrast there is the uh, Yuma applications that uh, worked very, very well. 
but I think Mustang may have a role. It's just that we may have to apply it more than twice, or we may need to throw something else in there or use one of those uh, more aggressive at plant uh, um, program. Uh, this next one took me a long time to analyze. It's seven years worth of data. So, um, which is a pretty sweet spot to have and no pun intended there, but uh, <laughs> it, um, so it's a very strong data set indicating that the good old com combination of the high rate of counter, and this is under pretty significant root maggot pressure. I included 2021 in there, same location as the plots that Jake uh, presented to you, um, uh, the St. Thomas location. And so we had good pressure throughout this study and uh, we got excellent performance out of these, these combinations. As you can see, the that uh, revenue gain above the untreated check. So compared to doing nothing, uh, grossing uh, you know, a, a differential of $438 is pretty darn good. Um, let's see. And uh, another thing to point out is that uh, in addition to counter at the high rate doing well, it was not out did not outperform comparable programs that included poncho beta at planting with either counter at plant or as a post-emergence material. And that's something we've been looking at for a few years now. We're getting very good performance out of counter as a post-material. Uh, the grower just needs to know they can only apply that counter once. So um, it just depends on what how they're set up for applications. So to summarize the insecticide stuff, um, Bifender FC, I think is interesting and I'd sure like to uh, keep looking at that. Um, and we've seen a pattern of performance where the T-band tends to work better. We've looked at it post-emergence as well. And uh, I think we still have to figure out, kind of isolate the be best time to apply it. Uh, and Indigo ZCX, as I had mentioned, I didn't show you data on it, but we it's looking somewhat promising. Uh, we just need to understand how well it's going to work as a post emergence broadcast. And, uh, and interestingly, also the year that we ran it as a T band, it was comparable to counter at both the high and the moderate rate. Uh, Echozen Plus, uh, modest poten potential. Uh, with that material. Um, and I, I couldn't show you that data either because it wasn't common across those two years, but it's something I could dig back into and, and probably study more. Um, but I think it's something that we uh, should be looking at uh, further because we're kind of running out of tools. Um, as you saw, Asana performed better when we added that synergist and that is a synergist that is quite uh, specific to improving the efficacy of pyrethroid materials. So I'd also like to look at exponent with things like, uh, like uh, Bifender and Mustang as well. Maybe get a little more bang out of them. Uh, counter 20G continues to work well um, as a uh, root maggot tool. Uh, Midac, uh, both uh, drip, dribble infurl and the uh, the three inch T band over the years has, over the last few years has looked okay, uh, at least in the, in the ballpark of the uh, moderate rate of counter. So I, there's certainly good potential there. We just need to understand it a little better and research it more. Uh, Mustang Max as that one chart showed, it's, it's not quite as, as uh, effective as uh, chlorpyrifos, but I think it's, it, it's certainly gonna be a tool we're gonna have to get used to using and uh, know how to use it best. And then Thymac 20G, as the granular slide showed you, is also a very good performing tool. And uh, as I've iterated many times, um, it's very, the timing of application can be very flexible as a post-emergence tool. So just a couple of slides about the uh, root maggot forecast uh, and population trends. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I guess it's nice to be winning, but uh, um, the, the maggot, I think, is the one that's winning. But uh, I wasn't really looking forward to uh, having another increase in the uh, overall 
root maggot fly activity. But this, this is valley wide and uh, 2021, what actually represented the highest root maggot populations. And this is valley, a valley wide average uh, in the last 15 years. So we've got work to do. Uh, this next slide transitions, you've seen this one before, it'll just, it'll skip every other year. So 2018, this is what our forecast looked like. Oops, 20, I'll go back, 2018, 2020, and this is what we're expecting for 2022. Not necessarily a whole lot more of the intense high pressure, but it's spreading out a little bit. And then the moderate pressure, uh, areas, moderate risk areas have expanded. So um, I'll skim through this. This will be presented at the grower meetings and on the websites as well. So, uh, but we've got a lot of high risk areas and even more moderate risk areas as I mentioned. So with that, I'll wrap it up. I just wanna make sure I thank the r &E board. Um, we really appreciate the, the funding support you provide. Um, we believe we put it to good use and we work really hard to hopefully uh, provide your the growers you represent with uh, good returns. I want to thank the cooperators, uh, Daryl Collette this year and Wayne and Austin Lassard uh, for several years and probably more in the future. American Crystal Ag staff, uh, CNR Ventures out of St. Thomas, North Dakota, Jermaine Seed Technology, uh, the crop and uh, uh, the pest management uh, companies and seed companies as well and our fabulous summer crew that we had last year. And then uh, partial funding is also provided by USDA and NFL. So with that, I will be around until closing time. So thank you.